glad to see Mark and Jean here this morning. Thank you so much. I watched both your services that you did in my absence and listened to your sermons, which have inspired me to do a four-part series on healing. Especially, yes, thank you for that. Especially with um, this weekend and the remembrance of the September 11th attacks in the United States and with the pandemic that still rages on, with the discord that we're facing, in terms of racial divides in the nation, political unrest, just as crazy as any time has ever been. We need to look at healing. And this morning we're going to look at healing in the bodily sense. And I'm going to be reading one of the stories where Jesus is healing. And this comes from Mark's Gospel, the 10th chapter, verses 46 through 52. They came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples and a large cloud, crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. They called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think most of you know by now that I began my ministry in the Baltimore-Washington Conference in Deaf Ministry. I did everything that I do here, but I did it in sign language. And Mark and Jean's daughter actually served the Magothy Church of the Deaf, where I served uh, as my second appointment. And one of the things that people tend to do is to say, if you had to choose to give up your sight or your hearing, which would you give up? What do you all say? You've all played that game, haven't you, before? If you had to choose one, you'd give up your hearing? How many of you would give up your hearing who are here? Raise your hand. How many of you would give up your sight? Nobody wants to give up their sight. Now, Helen Keller, some of you remember her, not in person, but I don't think they teach that much about her anymore. She was a woman who was born blind and deaf, or became blind and deaf at a very young age. And she was asked later in life when she learned to communicate, which was worse, being blind or being deaf. She said, being blind separates you from things, but being deaf separates you from people. It's an important thing to know. You may be able to see, but if you can't hear anyone, you're cut off from your family. But here we have a story of a man who is blind, and he is cut off from both things and people. He is cut off from people because he is ignored, basically. He's sitting in the road begging. Now, if you remember the story that we read last week about the widow who gave the last two cents that she had trust in God, and I said what she was really having to trust was that the people there around her would do the right thing in God's eyes by caring for her. It's the same situation here. Bartimaeus was sitting in the road begging, which means that no one was caring for him. And this is happening in Jericho. And if you remember the story of the road between Jericho and Jerusalem being a dangerous place, and it was traveled by priests and Levites, because the priest's residence was in Jericho, and they had to travel that road. We know the story that we call the Good Samaritan that happens along that road. But here we are in Jericho, the place where the priests are, and the man is begging in the streets. And he is basically being ignored. People are passing by him. And can you imagine what it is like when you cannot see to be sitting in the road? You don't know if an animal is coming by. You don't know what is happening around you. You have no idea what is going to befall you. And if someone gives you a coin, you may have to feel around in the dirt for it. The man is being blamed for his inability to see as well. We can tell that because of the way they ignore him. And so often times in scripture, people who have some sort of physical disability, it's attributed to their sinfulness and their unworthiness in the eyes of God. And if you think that's stopped, it hasn't stopped for a moment. I can't tell you the comments that I had when the AIDS epidemic began in this country. And I've mentioned to you before that I have done so many funerals for people with AIDS, not just homosexuals or drug users, although I have done funerals for both 
people in those groups who died of AIDS, but people who during a blood transfusion contracted this deadly illness and wouldn't tell anyone what happened to them. And they died in isolation, very much like some of the people dying from the pandemic now are dying. But I read again and again about how it was their own fault. They brought it upon themselves, just as the people in New Orleans were blamed for Hurricane Katrina and the people in Haiti were blamed for the earthquake there by religious leaders on television saying that it was the the fault of the deal that their ancestors had made with the devil in Haiti that made God punish them with an earthquake. It also took the lives of the head of UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, and the head of Volunteers and Mission, who were there scouting out locations to send mission teams. So we still tend to blame people for their misfortunes. But the man, for some reason, is aware that Jesus is passing by. Perhaps the crowd has been saying, here he comes, here comes that Jesus fellow. This is at the end of Mark's Gospel. We're coming close to the time when he's going to be leaving Jericho and he's going to be going on the way, and that way is to Jerusalem, and that way is to the cross. And so the man hears that Jesus is going by, and with all the power that he has in him, he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David. That's one of the key parts of this passage. Son of David, meaning this man, blind as he is, sitting in the dirt begging, knows exactly who is coming by. The priests and the Levites are clueless, but the blind man is the only one who can see. And he cries out again, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That is a title of royalty. The one who is coming, the Messiah, would sit on the throne of his ancestor David. He knows exactly who he is and what he needs from him. Now the crowd suddenly changes. They're like, oh, take heart, buddy. He's calling you. Come on, let's get up and go to him. Because Jesus says, bring him to me. Send him to me. And here we have the other great, great statement of faith. What does he do? He doesn't just go to him. What does he do? Do you remember? Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Now, I'm not a real fan of the chicken soup for the soul, but there was a great story in there once about a place where there was a great drought. The rain had stopped, and the people decided to get together to have a prayer service, and they were all told to bring a symbol of their faith, to bring something that showed their faith. So the Christians brought a cross, and the Jews brought a Star of David, and other people brought items from their own tradition. There was one little kid there. What did he bring? You know this part of the story? He brought an umbrella because he trusted that if he prayed, his prayer would be answered. Here is a blind man that throws off his cloak. This is a huge part of this story because if you're throwing off your cloak and you're blind, and then you're going to be blind at the end of the story, what's going to happen to your cloak? You're not going to know because you're not going to be able to find it again because this is a huge crowd, and they're all pressing in, and he's trying to get to Jesus. And he goes to Jesus, and Jesus says to him, what we think is probably the duh of all questions, what can I do for you? And he says, I want to see. And Jesus, who is amazed at the level of his faith, says, oh, your faith has made you well. And immediately his eyes are open. Can you imagine being blind and being able to see? This morning, I was wondering if I was going to have to call somebody to my house to pick me up because I took my glasses off and then I couldn't find them again. I was wandering around and I finally went and got my computer glasses on, which meant that I could see things as long as they were that far away. And I'm peering around and I'm feeling around and I finally found my glasses and I gave thanks to God, my Savior. Now, I didn't cry out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, but that was the next step. I tell you what, if I had to call somebody to come and rescue me from my own home, but imagine not being able to see and suddenly the sunlight comes pouring in and you're able to make out shapes and you're able to see, which means that he is able to find work, which means he's able to stop begging, which means he is able to go back to the temple to praise God, to make his offering. It means he's able probably to get married and have children, something that had been denied him because he was a beggar sitting in the street. But he throws off his cloak because he trusts if he can just get to Jesus, everything is going to change in his life, and it certainly did. And what does he do? He follows him on the way, and the way is the way of the cross. 
this story about healing tells us a lot about the relationship between healing and prayer. Because what is our prayer today other than crying out to Jesus? Help me, Lord. Save me, Lord. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. If we began every day with that prayer, we would have a different world. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Knowing where to go, not letting anyone get in our way, but praying and praying and praying again. The prayer of this man has a powerful effect. And then we read from James. James traditionally understood to be the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. James is saying, is anyone among you sick? Pray. Pray if you're joyful. Give thanks. Express your praise. Give your glory to God. And if you're sick, let the elders come and lay hands on you and anoint you. I do usually in my ministry practice services of anointing with oil and the laying on of hands in prayer because what does it say? But the prayer of the faithful is a powerful thing. But if we want to be healed in our bodies, in our minds, in our spirits, or in our world, we need to know where to go, who to cry out to, and to trust that all we need to do is to get there. And if we just get there, that Christ will hear us. Now, I don't want you to think that if you pray for someone who is ill and they do not recover that you have failed or that God has failed. People would say to me when my husband was near his, the end of his life, people would say to me all the time, I'm praying for him to be healed. And I would say to them, God knows we would like a miracle. And with my husband's condition, the only thing that would save him would be a miracle. But I asked them to pray for strength for us. Pray for strength. That's what we need right now. We need strength because our trust is in God. Just as Gary sang this morning, we know where we're going. Now, we're not necessarily in such a hurry to get there, are we, if we're honest? Because we do pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are hurting. We pray for those who are in need. We pray for those who are struggling. I know that when my mother had cancer, people told me all the time, what are you going to do? They'd ask me, what are you going to do if your mother dies? What happens to your faith? And I would say to them, I did not come to faith in seminary. I did not come to faith as a pastor. I came to faith listening to my mother sing me to sleep with the hymns of the church and the proclamation of God our Savior in Jesus Christ. So this life is temporary. We are going on to life eternal in God in Jesus Christ. But we should pray for one another. One of my Good friends that we prayed for last week, Reverend Malcolm Frazier, was released from the hospital after having a bout with COVID. He is one of the healthiest people I know. He is tall and lean, and he plays tennis, and he eats well, and he came down with COVID. They're not sure where. His ministry is at Asbury Village, which has a nursing home and also senior living facilities that are independent. They have condominiums and apartments and cottages, and this, then they have assisted living in a nursing home. That is where his ministry is, and he loves his ministry, and they're not sure where he contracted it. They cannot trace where he got it. But this very healthy man told me when he was able to text, and then when he got out of the hospital with a very raspy voice, he called me up and he said, this is the worst thing he ever lived through, and he had a very mild case of it. And he begged me to be careful by being in contact with people. And when I read the folks online who say this is all a hoax, talk to my friend Malcolm, it's not a hoax. But the other thing that he told me that really made an impact on me, he felt people praying for him. Because I reached out, I asked him if it was all right to share his condition with the elders of the church, of the United Methodist Church of the Baltimore Washington Conference, and he said yes. And I saw a powerful thing happen on Facebook. People who don't agree on anything short of Jesus as Lord came together and prayed for this man and prayed him to wholeness. I believe that fully. He said he felt power coming into his heart through the prayers of others. So what does this tell us about healing? It tells us about our own healing, that we're responsible for going to God. But it tells us about the healing of others, that we should be carrying their names in our hearts to God every day. I can't guarantee that you will be healed in the way that you think you may be healed. I remember years ago, a man in one of my congregations who was diagnosed with cancer, and he had a terrible couple of years, and he was angry at first. But people came with him and prayed all the time. He told me flat out that he did not like me at all. He didn't want me as his pastor. 
And I said, do you still want me to visit you? And he said, let me think about that. And he had his wife call me and say, he wants to see you again. We got to the point where I was going to see him regularly. And in his agony, one day he said to me, I love you. I said, you know who this is, don't you? You're not, you're not losing your faculties here. And he said, no. He said, I have learned to love you. And he had learned to accept that the end of his life was the source of his truest healing. And his children, who did not attend church, he gathered them to him. And they said to him, God has failed you. And he said, God is my savior. And I am going on to the complete healing. But trust me, I've been healed now. His relationships were healed with his family, even though he came to the end of his earthly life. We have to be a praying church, folks. We have to be praying. We have to pray every day for the end of this COVID pandemic. We have to pray for the doctors and the nurses and all who care, because that was what my friend Malcolm said. More than praying for him, he said, please pray for these people who have cared for me, for their compassion, their kindness, their hard work, their tears when they lose a patient, that they were devastated by that because they've committed their lives and they believe that God has instilled in them, many of them do, the gift of healing. We need to become a praying church, and we need to become praying individuals to pray for ourselves, not to let anything get in the way of us going to Christ when we need help, when we need healing, when we need hope, and not to get in anyone else's way as well. You may be the one who brings someone to faith. You may be the one who brings someone to Christ. You may be the one who brings someone to healing because the prayer of the faithful is a powerful thing. I hope you'll remember the story of Bartimaeus. His life was changed forever. And don't forget his response, because immediately, immediately, he stood and he praised God and he followed Christ, even to the cross. And because of the cross, we will follow Christ even beyond. As Gary said, that's where we're going. And do you want to go with me? And I hope the answer for each of us is yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Amen.